the Barbell Medicine Podcast, where we bring modern medicine to strength and conditioning and strength and conditioning to modern medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum, with a very special guest, Dr. Derek Miles. He's here. He's online. What's going on, Derek? How's it going, Jordan? You having a good, good day? Yeah, man. It's you know, we're answering questions from the internet today on episode 195, uh, October 2022 QA. And we thought, who who better to talk some crap with but Dr. Miles, and I, I feel like this is perfectly teed up for you. I would do my best to be as entertaining as I possibly can with my <laughs> answers. Well, so because again, you do the you do the cooking with adhesions bit. You've been doing a bunch of Q and A's recently, and uh, I, I was like, this is a perfect fit. Plus, you know, Austin's in the hospital right now doing doing doctor things, and so this is a it uh, works out perfectly. And and you get a chance to plug your new uh, ankle sprain article that's going to be dropping next week. So, uh, what is what was that article about, and uh, what are, what can people look forward to? We had had a, a lot of questions about how to deal with ankle sprains, and we or I tore through the evidence on what best recommendations are and how things have transitioned over the past ten years. We get into should you use orthotics, when to seek consult, and the too long didn't read is if you can't walk on your ankle after you've sprained it, you should go to the ER and go get some imaging done. Yeah, little Ottawa ankle rule kind of kind of thing going on there. Nice. Yeah, it's interesting to kind of convey that to the lay public because a lot of those rules are predicated upon knowing certain palpation spots that I wouldn't expect someone with a non-medical background to understand. Mm-hmm. But, you know, can you walk on it? Yes, no. If no, go straight to the ED. Do not pass go. Yeah, yeah. Do not click. Well, you can give them $200. It's probably going to be more than yes. that. <laughs> um, in addition, we do have seminars coming up. So our, we have some t- uh, two-day live in-person seminars coming up. The two-day health and performance seminar that Dr. Baraki and I and the rest of the crew uh, put on. We have one in Los Angeles that's coming up here in November uh, next month. Uh, and then you guys are back live in action in Miami in January. Uh, when's the last time you guys did a seminar? What was that? Oregon? It was, uh, yeah, it was Portland, Portland. So okay. So March. Yeah. So it's been, it's been a minute. Um, I expect some significant changes to the, to the seminar material. So it's going to be you, Chris, Hugan. who else, who else is showing up? Cam and Charlie. So we have definitely built in a lot more, uh, lab portions out of it and want to go through some case scenarios and how we actually work through some of the presentation of clients we deal with, uh, both from a programming standpoint and from a communication standpoint and going through the rehab process. Yeah. And talking with Cam and Charlie about it, that was kind of my biggest takeaway that it, the seminar before was uh, a lot of information and this is still a lot of information, but this, you get a lot more practical application uh, of it here. And that's just kind of, that's how the sem- these seminars kind of evolve over time. You, you kind of come up with material that you think is useful and, and people tell you that this is what we want. And then you get some feedback and you keep kind of rolling it around in your brain. And you're like, mm, we could tweak it a little bit, do this, do this, do this, do this. And so, yeah, I'm excited to see this, uh, to see this. So that's in January. Uh, we'll also be in the two day, we'll have another two day seminar in Atlanta in February of 2023. And then we'll be in New York, uh, in Mar- uh, May of 2023. And so there'll be other seminars, uh, as we, as we get them scheduled and we'll put that, um, all on the link in the description below. We have a few spots left, so go check that out. Uh, as always, our protein is back in stock. Um, if you guys are looking for a high quality whey protein supplement, ours is back in stock. It's got 80 calories, only a handful of ingredients. And it's third party tested, nothing in it, but whey protein. And, uh, that's why we made it. We just wanted a simple whey protein. And that's what we have. If you're into a protein supplement, we have one and, uh, help support our efforts here at Barbell Medicine. And last but not least, uh, we're, we're running a, uh, uh, out of apparel once more. People are like, when are you going to get these new shirts in? When you, you know, well, we still have some shirts available. They're almost all sold out. And then uh, we'll have another run coming up uh, next month. But uh, yeah, if you want to rep Barbell Medicine in the, in the gym and, uh, you know, we'd appreciate that. You can check that out in the link in the description below. All right. So this is a and a What we've done is we've curated questions from the internet. And uh, have you ever watched in the answer the internet sec- uh, stuff on YouTube? These are wild. Those are wild questions. We are not doing that. We're answering. <laughs> more uh more g and pg rated questions than than that but i i do like those segments those are kind of funny especially because the people are usually comedians or some sort of they've had wild experiences and so the stories they tell yeah we'll we'll see what we get into but uh, i've broken this up 
uh, by category. So we're going to start with a general training section here. So general training. So first up, Dr. Derek Miles online here, episode 195 of the Barbell Medicine Podcast. How is your training going? What are you doing and how's it going? Um, I, my current focus is still on rowing right now. So I'm getting between 30 and 40 miles a week of low intensity, steady state and lifting three days a week, 30 to 40 miles on a rower. Mm -hmm. Dude, what, how many meters, how many meters is that? Uh, I believe it was like 54,000 last week. What in the, that's a lot. If you're listening to that and you're like, I don't know how to contextualize that. I'm doing a, a significant amount of conditioning, like hours and hours uh, per week. I think I'm at close to seven hours of conditioning per week, which is a non-insignificant amount. And even if I did that all on the rower, there's no chance that I'm coming close to that. Well, I'm, a lot of it is like steady state. So sure. it's not like I'm trying to break the chain on every stroke. Sure, yeah. It, it's a lot of uh, listening to podcasts and, and just putting in the meters right now. And my goal is going to become springtime to start actually like getting into a 2k prep and then seeing what I can do with some of the volume work. What's your fastest 2k time that you've ever rode? I, I would have to go back and look, but I qualified seventh at crash bees my sophomore year of college, which is an indoor rowing race. Is that Boston? It's like in the, no, in the it was uh, in Tennessee oh, that okay. year. So out of the region, and I think I pulled a 641. Dude. So. That's flying. All right. Well, new goals, <laughs> new horizons. <laughs> That's So training's going well. You spend a lot of time on the rower. You're doing, you're lifting still. So how do you, how do you break that up? Are you lifting first? Uh, I mean, I guess you're, you're having double days where you're doing both. Do you lift first, then row? Or are you rowing first, then lift? What's the, what's that look like? It completely depends on where the day is. I've been trying to drop my daughter off and then go to the gym on the way home because it's mm. on the path. And then I'll come home and the erg sits five feet away from my desk, which makes it very convenient to go hop on and go for 45 minutes if I have the moment to do it. Got it. Now, so you have the concept too. So mine came with this little, I think I have the the D monitor, uh, whatever. And then it's got a little like cell phone holder on top, which is completely inadequate to watch anything of substance. Cause you're like, like away from the thing. Are you, do you have like on the concept two bike that I have, there's a, like it, it'll hold an iPad or like a monitor of, of some sort. Did you change that out? Are you watching stuff while you're on the rower or just listening to stuff? Just listening. I have mm -hmm. gotten in the habit of like setting the books I read in front of the rower Mm -hmm. And it's a good little cognitive cue for when I zone out to, you know, reflect on some of that when I come back to, I, I found it's a really good mental game to knock out a thousand meters. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Uh, well, that's interesting. Okay. So you're lifting what three days a week and you're rowing mm -hmm. what five days a week, something like that. Five or six, five or six. Yeah. Well, it sounds like things are going well. Uh, I actually have a meet coming up about it's exactly a month. So I'm four, four weeks out, uh, from when this will go up. And, uh, this has been a very strange meat prep, uh, mainly because I <laughs> been doing so much other stuff that I'm like, am I really prepping for this meet? And then every time it comes, like I have to go do singles or whatever for squat bench deadlift. I'm like, Oh, well, I guess I'm strong. So I should probably do this meet. <laughs> but, but like the emphasis that I've been putting on this meat prep has definitely been, uh, l less than before. Um, even when I was coming back from like the last time with the shoulder dislocation and, and whatever. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm doing conditioning five days a week. I'm riding moto one to two times a week. Um, and so I have not like been tapering any of that stuff off in, in an effort to be like, I need more training resources. Um, I think the biggest difference in this meat prep is that be, my conditioning base was so much higher coming in that my recovery capacity is significantly higher, not just for the conditioning stuff, but for the actual resistance training stuff. And before, I mean, there were blocks where I was doing, you know, eight back offsets on squats and deadlifts, like a high volume stuff. Um, I'm still doing stuff like that but I just, it just doesn't phase me. Like whenever I have to log like, Oh, how do you feel? Are you, you know, on a one to five scale, are you super fatigued? Are you like, or are you fresh? I'm like, I feel pretty, pretty fresh. Uh, so I don't know. The only, only niggle that's been in there is I had a little back tweak, uh, that was bothering me. I couldn't actually, uh, pull anything of substance from the floor from, for about two weeks. 
So I just kind of modified it, did some mid shin work and some sumo work. And yeah, I pulled 660 last week at a six, no pain. So figure if I can work up to somewhere close to 700, then I'll be ready to go to this meet. And uh, I think, and I don't, I don't know, I may be a 198er for this meet. I might weigh in at 200 even. I didn't, I haven't been weighing myself because I'm just like, I don't really care. I, and I know that people are listening to this are like, what do you mean you don't care about my weight? I'm like, well, I'm not actively managing my weight at this point. Like, I just was kind of curious uh, what my weight would kind of naturally fluctuate to, um, even though I was consciously like, I want to lose a little bit of weight for moto. And uh, I've been doing all this extra conditioning and my weight kind of fluctuated down from 208, 207, something like that to 200 even. And I'm like, I'm pretty close to 198. So I don't know. I'm under, I'm under no, uh, uh, you know, delusions that if I let my weight go up another five or six pounds that I'll lift significantly more. Uh, I do think if I tried to max out like the 220 weight class, I'd probably lift more, but I would be, I would be terrible on a dirt bike. I just, it would be, <laughs> it's everything, everything's worse when you weigh more and you're trying to, trying to do that. Well, but I think there's a couple parts to that because one, it does make the case that just having that overall athletic base seems to be helping out yeah. and having what I would say is a pretty habit based day in and out yeah. makes it to where, you know, you probably don't have the same fluctuations in weight that you would have if it was more on and off along the way. Yeah. 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 I think the biggest change is, uh, I mean, I consciously wanted to lose a little weight for this moto season that just wrapped up. Um, uh, because I, I think when I started, like I said, like 208, 209, 210, right in there on a day-to-day -day basis. And then I just, I consciously pulled a few servings of carbohydrates from my diet and then, uh, started doing more conditioning. And then my weight is naturally trended down. I mean, not naturally. It just, I mean, that's a calorie deficit is what we've been in. So the only other thing of note, um, and you might get a kick out of this. So, the last meet prep we had for May, uh, I had dislocated my shoulder in February. And so we're just kind of working through that. I have adopted a wider grip, wider than I've ever used in my entire powerlifting career. I mean, my best bench in a meet is for 195 kilos. Um, and I did that with like a thumbs from the smooth type grip. So like a pretty narrow grip. And then at this meet in May, I did pinkies on the power ring. So a little wider. It seemed, I seemed to tolerate that a little bit better when I was getting back into it. And I was like, well, I'll just stick with this. And now I have my second di or my third digit on the score mark. So wider still. And it's like, I feel, I feel strong and stable and there's no like hesitation when I'm benching, even, even with the, the previous shoulder dislocation and all this training history with the closer grip. It's kind of weird because if I tried to do this four or five years ago, my bench would have been trash and and right now I, my strength is at or better than it's ever been with a wider grip and this is relatively late in my training career to make that change so i guess you can teach an old dog new tricks i don't know <laughs> but you look at it and it, it is that slow adaptation over time because you know five six years ago somebody would have told you that you were probably pretty ingrained in how comfortable you were in the current state and even messing with it might've been a little bit more of a, uh, challenge than doing it itself. Yeah. 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 You just got to dislocate your shoulder and do some new stuff and then you can tolerate <laughs> different things. I think that's the key. Sometimes uh, change just has to be forced upon you. Yeah. 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 All right. So training seems to be going well for both of us. Um, all right. This is an interesting question. I'm curious to what you answer here. So question number two, how do you warm up for the barbell lifts? So you have to squat. What are you doing? I'm warming up with a barbell. Normally I walk into the gym, grab the barbell, hit a set of empty bar, hit a set working up to wherever I'm going to be and just slowly get there. Uh, I would say at this point, because of the same conditioning thing, I get to like my RPE six relatively quickly now because I'm not uh, needing the recovery. And then uh, typically from the moment I walk in the gym to my first working set is I would say 15 minutes on average now. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's speedy. Yeah. You're just in it. Yeah. And, but you, you work out mostly in your garage or your, is it in the house? Well, I've been, or? I've been in the gym for the past, uh, okay. eight weeks now. Okay. I needed a little bit of the, uh, somebody I didn't know staring at me to <laughs> talk me into adding a couple kilo to my lifts. So yeah, that works. 
Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much the same except for on on the squat. I've been doing the only thing else that I'll do is like I'll do some uh, I call them plate press outs. I'll like squat to the bottom body weight and I'll have like a 25 pound plate in my hands and I'll like press it out. And it all it does for me is it's like a little upper back like, oh, hey, those are muscles that you're going to want to use and like and maybe some active warm up of my shoulders in a position that's more tolerable than cranking myself under a bar straight away. Uh, so I'll do a few of those, hang out the bottom of the squat for like 20 or 30 seconds. And then I'm like, okay, I'll do empty sets with the bar. I, uh, for the bench press, I just bench. And then for the deadlift, I just, I just deadlift. There's no like additional warm up. I've tried, I've tried literally everything. I've done the couch stretch. I've done pigeon pose. I've done lacrosse ball, foam rollers, band distraction stuff. The whole effort is like, like I don't care about any of those things. I'm meaning that I don't think that any of them are like uniquely good or bad or whatever. If they made me feel better and perform better on a regular basis uh, and didn't otherwise like, you know, Jedi mind trick me into believing I'm some sort of fragile, like decomposable thing, then, then great. But I've tried and all they do is just waste time for me. And so like, it would be, you said it took 15 minutes for you to get to your top work set or close. It would be taking me 30, 40 minutes. I'm like, what am I doing? I got stuff to do. I, you know, I've got all, I have a lot of time to train. That is true, but not all of the time to train. I gotta, I gotta get through this, especially <clears throat> if I have nine back offsets, you know, whatever. Oh boy. If it takes me 40 minutes to get my top set, I'm squatting for an hour and a half and then I got to go bench or whatever. And so, uh, since I d didn't really notice any benefit to any sort of, wait, do I have more range of motion I can access? Do I feel more comfortable? Do I perform better? That was like, well, I'm just, I'm just going to kick this out of my program. There's no point to it. And so when, when people ask me like, oh, should I do this mobility stuff? I'm like, I don't know. Do you think it's helping? Like, how do you feel about it? You know, what do you think about it? What do you think it's doing? Well, I think something to talk about here is just how long on average are your sessions? Oh, sure. Yeah. So my, my sessions right now, I'm finishing just at like two hours. That's pretty much my, they range. It's like 90 minutes on a shorter, lower priority session. So if that's like belt squats, incline bench, you know, feet up close grip stuff and some back work. So it's not like a comp heavy day. Um, even though each of those movements I'm pushing the intensity to the, to where it needs to go. It's just not like this thing matters how much I'm lifting it, like whatever. Yeah, that'll be 90 minutes. But if it's a comp squat, comp bench, comp deadlift, they all wrap together, that's going to be two hours or whatever. But if I had a 30 minute warm up prior to that, now we're talking two and a half hours, you know? But I think that's good to hear for people because sometimes, especially on the pain and rehab side, we'll get people that are like, well, I have an hour to devote to this mm. and I want to maximize my potential in the gym. Like, well, we have constraints just on how long we can rest on what we can do today. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes I think we don't talk enough about just the time in gym mm -hmm. that we get because, you know, you get somebody who's like, well, I have 45 minutes, three times a week and I want to medal at the next meet. And you're like, well, I hope you've been training for a really long time. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Like it, it's, or it's, you're in a rural state with a really small meet. Yeah. No one shows up. Yeah. 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 It's, it's kind of like, it's like if the stretch or the mobility thing or whatever you're thinking about adding, if you think it's going to be better than another set of squats or another set of bench press or deadlifts or some other very specific sort of practice for, in this case, a barbell sport, like powerlifting, knock yourself out. As long as it doesn't build this weird narrative where you're like, I have to do this. Otherwise I'm going to hurt myself or I'm damaged or I'm incomplete or broke or whatever. I'm fine with it, but the odds are doing another set of squats is probably be more beneficial, right? It's just, if your goal some, is to top end your squat. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Or if it's, or if you're like a, you know, their conditioning sport or some other sort of recreational pursuit, I think something more specific to that is probably better. Uh, and then, so then, so the next, then people will be like, well, what about on my off days? And it's like, maybe having a dedicated off day is better than, than doing this other stuff. Yeah. I, so. Yes, I, I would certainly agree with that. I think uh, there is this because the other side of it is the people that want to train six days a week for two hours. And you're like, well, now we really have to work out some low intensity variability stuff to where we're making you feel like you got a workout in, but we're not pushing you past your capacity. Yep. Yep. We agree. All right. Okay. Question number three. 
which health-related adaptations to exercise persist after cessation of exercise? This is actually an interesting question. I thought about this for far too long because I because you want to be correct, right? I don't want to give a flippant answer and be like, oh, I missed this. <clears throat> my, my take on this is the body is dynamic all of the time where it is alive. <laughs> like it is adapting to what you are doing all of the time, whether that's high a high use high throughput situation or a low use low throughput situation so the so if you're on bed rest you are adapting to that and if you are you know very active meeting or exceeding the physical activity guidelines you're adapting to all of that um i think the biggest or most prolonged adaptation that you're likely to have related to exercise is going to be uh, the persistence of the uh, skeletal muscle myonuclei which is effectively the uh cell the uh uh, nucleus of a cell. There's uh, skeletal muscle fibers have multiple nuclei, and that's where all the proteins are made. That's where all the DNA uh, is stored, etc. And so, even when you stop exercising, you retain the increased number of myonuclei uh, that is generated by a training. That's one of the mechanisms of hypertrophy, for example. As you start training, you develop more of these myonuclei. They make more protein. Muscle gets bigger. That's one of the mechanisms. When you stop training, the muscle gets a little smaller, but you retain all these myonuclei. And one of the thoughts uh, behind muscle memory is that once you restart training, you can call upon all those myonuclei that you've uh, developed over time, and then your muscle swells back up uh, in pretty rapid fashion, much faster than it originally took you to get bigger. That is a the theory. There are... There's some nuance there as far as how long does that persist? Is that the real mechanism? And so I, I don't know that I would, you know, write that in, in stone and hang my hat on it. But when I think about other adaptations, things like strength, uh, particularly like neurological adapt, uh, uh, adaptations to strength, other uh, structural adaptations, so tendon stiffness, muscle stiffness, things of that nature, muscle penation angle, all these things. Uh, when I think about cardiorespiratory fitness, all of those things are dynamic. And I don't think that they just stay there. They just, so they, they just the, don't. The one we have evidence for, and once again, there's some nuance to this, is really bone mineral density. Uh, there's a decent number of papers that talk about essentially through your adolescent years to early 20s is when most of your bone mineral density accrues. Now, there's probably a little bit of a chicken or egg conversation there about how much of that is the fact that this 15 years ago when these studies were coming out was the most active period of most individuals' lives. And I would be willing to bet if you took a runner in their 20s and turned them into a lifter in their 30s, you're still going to see changes out of that. And how long does that hang? But there is, I would say, moderate to decent evidence that the more you do early on for bone health, the better your slope of decline is later in life. Yeah. You're going to start from a higher peak the, and then, and that's going to be protective in some way in and of itself. And if you maintain any like activity, you can, it's almost like maintenance uh, to, to kind of slow the decline, but you're still adapting to whatever you're doing. It's not like it just stays there and doesn't change again. The body is dynamic. And so I don't know of any physiological adaptation that you get from exercise that will not change after you stop exercising. Well, but if you look at this question, there's kind of layers to it because it's like, well, how long after cessation or, you know, or like how much are we considering to be an adaptation? Because, you know, if you train and you increase your strength by 300% and you drop to 250% after eight weeks of cessation, uh, you're still better off than someone who never trained. Yeah, there are a few studies on like D1 football players where they go like preseason, they're hitting it hard, do like a one RM squat and bench, test that, and then they don't actually lift weights for the next eight weeks, I believe is the, the study duration. And then they test their back squat and, and bench press, and they've lost, you know, less than 5% on average. And, and it's like, cool, that's eight weeks. But what about at 80 weeks? You know, like you, if you extend the timeline long enough, you're, you're still maybe better off than where you started. And I, I, I probably would agree that that is a likely prediction like that's likely to happen but uh man it it's just yeah the timeline timeline's gonna matter for sure here cool all right next question if clients can't get in the prescribed number of days would you rather they combine the days or skip them i'm i'm a i'm a combiner do it all 
I, I am a combiner nine times out of 10. So yeah, I'm yeah, trying I mean, to think of a situation where I'm like, you should split this up because there's like some increased risk or increased general badness that would occur. And I, I cannot think of that when people, if people are like, Oh, I'm going out of town. Should I do back to back to back sessions rather than, you know, miss a session? I'm like, yes, just, you, you're going to have to adjust the load, adjust the volume and just whatever to make it a similar level of stress that we were targeting in the first place. Uh, and if you come into the sessions pre-fatigued or your sessions, you know, now you have six exercises instead of five, like, yeah, that's going to affect your performance in that workout, but I don't care about your work, your performance in that workout that much. I care about the adaptations that we're driving. So, well, I, I would say here, my caveat is sometimes with my adolescent athletes to where I will run a program out to eight, nine exercises just because their titration of RPE is so off mm -hmm. that i don't want them to walk into a session with 15 exercises in sure. one day. Yeah. So most of the time then, if they're going to skip, I will pare down the days to what I think is the higher priority out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's some, there's probably some threshold here, right? It's like, oh, I can only train one day this week. Should I do all of my squats, all of my deadlifts, all of my, and it's like, all right, maybe if your normal session would include like one squat pattern movement, one hinge pattern movement, one, one or two push, like maybe you cap it there. Like, you know what I'm saying? You don't add a bunch of extra stuff. Um, yes, yeah, so there's got to be some threshold sort of sort of thing. But uh, in general, if you're adding an extra exercise or you're doing back-to-back -back sessions, back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back sessions, I'm pretty – I don't really care. Do it. Yeah. Yeah, back-to-back -back doesn't bother me at all. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next question. How does rating of perceived exertion, RPE, accurately account for the intensity or effort that we bring to each set? I mean, RPE is principally measuring the exertion as you rate it or how hard the thing was. That's really the scale that we're using and lifting. So how hard was it? And so if you're bringing more intensity, right, you're getting charged up, Trap Slap, Metallica, Pantera, whatever your preferred hype up song is, um, or in your case, Derek, people watching you, this, the scale automatically slides up, right? Like it just, it's still, a, you know, it's still going to be an eight if you had two reps left in the tank or whatever scale uh, you're using. And if you're run down, tired, no music, no hype, no whatever, psych up, et cetera, it's still going to be an eight. It's just going to be maybe a little lighter. So that's kind of the beauty of it. It'll just automatically accounts for that. Well, but I think there's a little nuance here in how we anchor it because you are like, I fully agree. We're asking the question of what is hard, mm -hmm. but especially for a lot of novice lifters, it is, really defining that. So sometimes it is useful to, if we go RP eight, okay, give me two more reps and yeah. okay. Are we a failure yet? And yeah. And you can in or titrate the accuracy is probably the better way of saying that there, but there's also some, there was just a paper that came out uh, within the last year where they had individual squat and just told them to self-select their squat weight then took the same load and told them to squat as fast as they could out of the mm -hmm. hole. Yep. And I believe there was like a threefold difference in Watts between mm -hmm. the two. And there you're looking at it, but you're still anchoring to the, what is hard, but mm -hmm. you can tweak things uh, accordingly to get a little bit more frame of reference to where you're heading. Yeah. I mean, ideally you'd bring a similar level of effort each time. Like we're trying, for example, my cue to people often on the platform uh, at our seminars is I want you to try to move every rep as fast as possible on the way up, like as fast as possible on the way up. Um, and, and if like, that would be the sort of baseline effort level or, or, you know, uh, uh, thought during the movement. Um, I, I think maybe the real question here is like, what if I'm like turned up for on a particular day or a particular exercise or whatever, like, isn't that going to change what happens because of a given RPE? Like, yeah, it's still RPE eight, but if I'm like, you know, really trying hard, right. Uh, my effort level is high. Isn't that going to give me better results? And I think, or different results. Yeah. And I'm like, I, maybe I, I think in general, the variation between like a really high effort and maybe low effort for somebody who's like actually willing to show up to the gym, do this stuff day in and day out. <laughs> like that, that is probably not going to affect how well you do from a health perspective, certainly. And then from a performance perspective, eh, maybe I think the only thing I can make a strong argument for would be really trying to move the rep and the concentric 
portion of the lift as fast as possible because we know trying to maximize velocity does tend to generate better power uh, outcomes, better strength uh, outcomes, and in, in many cases, better hypertrophy outcomes. But other than that, like I just feel like the band, that variation is like relatively, it's relatively narrow for people that are willing to participate in this stuff. Like if it's somebody who doesn't want to exercise and you're forcing them, that that may grow, but yeah, I'm not sure. Well, but in the grand scheme of things, I would slant towards and in my rehab side might be showing over the arc of a couple months of training, I would be more okay in a trained individual with whatever they perceive an eight ending up a seven more yeah. often than eights accumulating to nines all the time. To nines. Yeah. Yeah. I'd rather you underdo it than overdo it. But you know, even if like, if you're, if you're saying, well, okay, half the days I'm bringing my a game, my F a effort game. And the other half of the days I'm bringing my C effort, like what happened, what would happen if I did all a effort? Like how is RPE helping? It's like, well, RPE's kind of controlling you. Like as far as limiting you from like how much you can add, how many, how much volume to do, how much reps, depending on how it's the program is actually set up. Uh, but I, I want an A effort the whole time. So if you, if if you're finding this large oscillation in like days that I, I'm bringing it and days that I'm just mailing it in, I'd start looking at the program, like what you're doing, why you're doing it, and like what particular aspects of training like really turn your turn your crank so we can get a better effort more frequently. Or the other side of it, what's contributing to those C effort days? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I like that. It's a, it's a human problem, maybe not an RPE problem. Uh, okay. Next question. Is training smaller muscles like the serratus anterior beneficial or necessary for hypertrophy? Let me just say something about the serratus anterior. I, I think my first introduction into like physical culture was like many people of our, our age w via Arnold Schwarzenegger. And that man's serratus anterior, I, what the hell's going on there? That thing looks like a sprocket, like a like a chain ring off a mountain bike. Just ch -ch 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 -ch. and I'm like, bro, how does that happen? Then I realized those are just, you know, tennis tennis inscriptions where the muscles actually inserted onto the rib. But still, I to this day, I'm like, that dude's chiseled. Uh, my answer to this, yeah, it, look, if you want those smaller muscles to grow, you're going to have to load them in some way. Do you have to load them directly? I don't know. It depends on your what the rest of your training looks like. But I think for a bodybuilding perspective, yep, at some point in your training, directly isolating muscles that uh, are visible and, you know, may not otherwise be directly loaded via the, your other exercise selection. I mean, that's just that's just kind of a training principle, one, training fundamental 101. I, I agree with everything you just said. I just think it's uh, interesting that this person picked the psoriasis anterior because to the example, I don't think you're going to see any bodybuilder ever program in like uh, bare pushups weighted to max effort to target the psoriasis. Like it's going to be something to where you're just getting protraction out of it and isolates kind of a misnomer there because you're going to be using other things. It's just you're driving something to where you're hitting the rate limiting step as best you can. Yeah. I think you see mostly like a pullover, like a dumbbell pullover or straight arm pull down. So you're getting like lat and serratus at the same time. And you're like, dude, I got a sick pump over there. And you're like, yeah, that general area. But, <laughs> but if it's like, no, you just bench press, it's like, mm, probably not good enough for like optimal physique outcomes. But in, in saying that, like, if you're just starting to train, you don't necessarily need to start there. Right. I mean, you, you can, like, I want, if that's what turns your crank again and you load it appropriately and program it appropriately, it, that's fine too. But I don't think you need to start there. It's maybe where you end up if that's your, if that's your goal. Yeah, I, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Any small muscle you can think of that you don't need to train. And what I mean, train, I don't necessarily mean isolate. I just mean like, you don't need to like even load it at any point. I don't know, maybe your proneus brevis. I mean, I'm <laughs> sure like if you're uh, like a sprinter, there's probably a case to be made even for that. Yeah. I'm thinking like genioglossus, like you probably don't need to do like a progressive loaded protocol for your tongue. Uh, maybe like your levator anti, like you probably don't need to like <laughs> load that over time. Some unwanted hypertrophy of your, uh, you know, pelvic floor, probably, probably not terribly useful. But it's funny you went the other way. I was like Anconius and Pronius Brevis, and uh, you, you went 
Yeah, I can appreciate ma- your ma- mouth and butt. Mouth and butt. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Nose to tail. Uh, all yep. right. Last question for our general training section. What is the most efficient form of cardio? Does Derek say rowing? Uh, the one you do. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in agreement. It's like, I, I don't know of any particular modality that is uniquely beneficial uh, uh, from a general conditioning standpoint um, to the com- as compared to another modality. Me- meaning like if it's walking, if it's jogging, if it's cycling, if it's rowing, if it's swimming, if it's erging, like whatever, it's all basically the same. It's just going to improve you the most in your ability to do how, however you're training. So if you erg, you're going to be a better erger. If you're a cyclist, you're going to be a better cycler than if you never did that. But as far as the actual like cardio respiratory fitness improvements, yeah, whichever one you do, I'd prefer you to do all of them. It's kind of like, it's kind of like training, right? Like is a squat better than the deadlift? Well, why not both? You know, like is what press or bench press both do both. I mean, whatever. I want you to be able to cycle if you need to jog, if you need to swim, if you need to, and like, having a wide range of physical development, like builds that base of the pyramid that you can then apply specifically if you want to. And then, you know, you're not like limited by your exposure. Uh, but yeah, in general, I don't really have any bones about what type of conditioning people do with this. The one caveat, if somebody's talking about like high intensity interval training, sprint stuff, I probably don't want them to sprint like running right off the gate unless they have yeah, a lot of we're history back to intensity just, conversation yeah. though. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's, it's like, okay, so you've never sprinted before you haven't sprinted in years and like, you just want to go full send. Like let's probably let's back that down. Yeah. Let's, let's try to build some capacity first, but I, I don't have that same reservation. If people are talking about a, a bike, you know, they're doing sprints on a bike. And I think that has to just do with the rate of force production, the, the loading, the, you know, velocity uh, and exposure on certain on certain tissues that may not be prepared, which you just don't get on the, on the bike. So, yeah, well, I mean, you don't have that big, like ground reaction force of striking the ground every time. So, yeah. Yep. Hopefully, hopefully if you're on a bike, the only ground reactive yeah, force I get on a bike is that I fall off. So yeah, I was going to say maybe with your shoulder hitting the ground present company excluded. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to move to the general health section here on episode 195 of the Barbell medicine podcast. Again, I'm with Dr. Derek miles. He's the head of our pain and rehab team. All right. If stress eating or getting ripped didn't exist, what would healthy look like from a mental, physical, and other standpoint? This was a question I got, and I, I was like, I don't even know if I can answer this. This is like, like, should we answer the meaning of life first, or like, like some other philosophical question? <laughs> Does God exist? Like, where, <laughs> should we do that first? I saw this earlier and really struggled with even how to frame the question because a lot of it is individual specific. And I think it's easier. It sucks because it is easier to say what is unhealthy than what is healthy. And I think it is that wide arrangement of factors that go into it. Like if you are meeting dietary requirements, you are happy with the way you look, uh, you are able to do the task you're trying to do. You're probably okay. Yeah. Like is. Yeah. I think there's, I mean, if you're satisfied, if you're happy, if you're able to do all the things you want to do. And I think I'd add the caveat, like not at increased risk of untoward outcome, like undesirable sort of trajectory, then maybe at that point, you've kind of reached this like health nirvana, like you're checking all the boxes and you don't have something like lurking around the corner. Like, you you know, you could, exa- you could think of an example where somebody's like pretty happy with their existence, right? They're able to do all the things they want to do, um, but are at significantly increased risk of developing type two diabetes or high blood pressure or having a stroke or whatever. And it's like, yeah, so what we'd want to do is maybe tweak things a little bit to sort of compress your morbidity rather than have this like long, slow decline into like old age and decrepitude. Like, no, I want you to sustain this happiness, if you will, this uh, uh, capacity, if you will, uh, as long as possible. So increase the health span, decrease, you know, compress the morbidity. The part of this question I didn't really get though, if stress eating or getting ripped didn't exist, does that mean like you're trying to get as lean as possible and you just can't? Or is it like we've never had these like social factors that like reward getting lean and so nobody's trying to walk around at like 10% body fat or less, be like, look how shredded I am. It's like, yeah, I think orthorexia has been something that's really uh, come to the forefront over the last 
decade, 15 years, and it's probably perpetuated yeah, yeah. a little bit more even with the advent of being able to filter everything. But yeah, it, it still comes down to the individual and being okay with where they're at. And I, I think that's, that is a little bit more of a philosophical question than a, uh, like something I can quantify in an Excel sheet. Yeah. Like I definitely want people to be happy with where they're at currently, even if they're engaged in a process that makes them better. The, the whole point is like, let's enjoy the process. And then the, and the outcomes are going to just stack and, and you're going to stack these wins over time. That's great. But if you're only going to be happy at the end, man, what a miserable journey. Like I'll, I'll only be happy once I lose this weight. Or I'll only be happy once I lift this amount. Or I'll only be happy once I have this much muscle. Or when I have this fitness, you know, capacity. And it's like, man, we gotta we gotta work on on that mindset, you know, as far as like and again enjoying the journey, enjoying where you're at now, uh, celebrating your body for for you know what it is. I, I think those are all important things. Uh, that doesn't mean be complacent and like ignore like your goals and your other desires, but it's kind of like, again, you can have both. Why not both? Like be happy with where you're at and what you're currently capable of. You are strong, you're resilient, all this other sort of stuff. But then also like want more. That's also, that's fine. Um, with the definition we use of health at our seminar is the ability to adapt and self-manage in the face of social, physical, and emotional challenges. That's from this uh, BMJ paper by Huber et al. I've linked that in the description. You guys can check that out. This is a pretty controversial topic. Like what is health? Is it just the absence of disease? Uh, probably we wouldn't agree with that. Uh, but like, I think having this capacity to basically adapt and thrive in virtually any sort of scenario, I think to me that that's, that's, you know, a good definition for health. And so that's why we use, use that definition at our, uh, at our seminar. Yeah. Derek. I'm okay with all of that. All right. All right, Derek, here we go. Energy drinks versus an actual pre-workout before a lift. What's your go-to? Neither. Ooh, you just, yeah. are you a psycho? Are you a psycho? I, you just, I think part of it is once again, I, my background was in rowing. So our practice started at 5.00 AM. Yeah. So but... I didn't want to wake up in the morning and chug something and then get out on the boat and go for two hours. So I just got mm -hmm. in the habit of getting up and getting out in the boat and going. Yeah. And I've also, I've, never had a pre-workout that I didn't feel, uh, like got me a little bit too high. <laughs> sure. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if I ever do go that way, it's energy drink, but 85% of the time it's none of the above. Yeah. I mean, I, I think if we're looking at this and we're trying to take a scientific view, it's like, what is the purpose of an energy drink or a pre-workout drink? The idea would be that it would somehow improve performance and or adaptations gleaned from the workout, right? And so the energy drinks, all it is is a, is a vehicle for caffeine. And so if you're trying to stratify like best to worst vehicles for caffeine outside of personal preference, because personal preference is gonna be like top of the list, like what's not gonna make you sick? What do you like the taste of? What do you have available to you? Like that, those are all top, top of the tops. But after that, if you're like, okay, should it be an energy drink? Should it be coffee? Should it be a gum? Should it be a lozenge? Should it be a whatever suppository? <laughs> at, at that point, you're really looking at timing. And so what we know is that like, for example, the caffeine in coffee is going to peak faster than the caffeine in an energy drink um, on the order of 15 to 20 minutes. And then at that point, you're talking about dosing. And so it's like, all right, energy drinks, very wildly with how much caffeine is in there. Some of them have a hundred, uh, milligrams, some hundred, I think the big monsters have like 160 milligrams and some of the like, uh, bang energy drinks are like 200 or 300 or whatever. And it's like the ergogenic dose for caffeine ranges between three to nine milligrams per kilogram body weight, which is a huge range, right? If I'm 90 kilos, we're talking 270, like all the way up to 810 milligrams. And like that, that's like, the difference between one energy drink maybe or like three cups of coffee and like 10. And so the dosing, the dosing there is, is kind of the, the next strategy. So I don't think it really matters where you get your caffeine from as long as it's the right dose and you prefer it. Uh, it could be gum. It takes even a little bit, uh, that's a little faster, but some people don't like the GI side effects uh, that come with that. Those tend to be a little more prevalent. Um, as far as energy drink versus coffee, again, it's more personal preference. The extra stuff in the energy drink isn't really doing anything for you, like the vitamins, the taurine, the whatever. It's all kind of a waste. It's just, if you like the way it tastes, go for it. Uh, and then as far as pre-workouts go, usually those have a, 
some sort of proprietary blend of bullshit in there. And it's like, yeah, we put caffeine and this homeopathic dose of vitamin B6 and a homeopathic dose of creatine. It's like not enough to actually get you any gains, but it's enough that the supplement remembers that it was there at one point. And it's like, it's like a, there's, there's more ink in the label than there is a dose in the can. That's our thing. Yeah. So like our Perry RX, for example, you could take that at any time of the day and get all of the supplements that we know would increase the adaptation you would get from the workout. And there are not a lot of those, uh, beta alanine, citrulline, uh, creatine, um, a handful of others, uh, maybe some beetroot extract or very others, various other forms of nitrates may improve the adaptations that you're getting from your workout. So more strength, more hypertrophy, more cardiorespiratory fitness, but it doesn't really matter when you take those things. And so designating something as a pre-workout only, I'm like, eh, it's probably a miss. Other, unless you're just talking about the caffeine, in which case, let's just talk about caffeine. And at that point, I'm like, what is your preferred vehicle of getting the caffeine into your system? Uh, and then dosing. So I, I typically start people on the lower end if they want to use caffeine, three to nine milligrams per kilo, uh, 30 to 45 minutes prior, and then uh, just see how they feel. And if you feel good, you feel like, okay, I've got, I'm focused, I'm able to to do the, ex, the the training session, I don't have any side effects, great. You don't need to go up from there. If you're not feeling it, you can try adding more. Uh, my caveat here is if it's after 3 or 4 p.m., it's probably not worth the potential impact in your circadian rhythm from a sleep standpoint just to lift a few more pounds. Um, and also, I don't want to see you dry scoop that shit. I've <laughs> seen, like, like, I get it. Your core, you're in the car, you just dry scoop it straight to the dome. And I'm like, oh boy, like, that's just, for me, I'm like, this is a choking hazard. Like something bad's going to happen. <laughs> it's the same people who ate sand as a kid. That's right. Yeah. I did think about what if I made a supplement, we changed, we rebranded Perry RX to crank and it was intranasal and you had to do one line one line <laughs> per 50 kilos of body weight. You just want, do you know how well that would sell? Oh like, man. People would love it. Yeah. Uh, it, come into your to nose, a, uh, into your muscles near you. hundred yeah. percent. We'll call it crank intranasal pre-workout. Yeah. Weight-based dosing. It was either, it was either that or like a, a pre-workout dip. You just like, all right, caffeine, that has caffeine, to down. You, you just look, you just chew this thing for 45 minutes <laughs> get yourself right i mean maybe that we'll do exist maybe we'll do both and uh that's how you know that barbell medicine has jumped the shark we just fully went away from evidence-based practice so we just started play playing to the masses we got a big tiktok audience and we're just like snorting pre-workout on <laughs> that's the, oh man all right somebody's gonna somebody's gonna email us and be like dude that what a great idea can i use that i'm like yes take it i don't want it we're gonna see it on the market six months from now that's right uh okay Stretching slash mobility work on rest days, waste of time or good idea? What do you say, Dr. Derek Miles? If it gets you moving in different ways, I think there is some potential for it. As far as the necessity for it uh, to become whatever iteration of deformable, uh, there's not really as much of a point, but really... I think one thing I've softened my stance on a lot is the need for there to be some variation in programming in general. And especially in the powerlifting community, if everything is SBD heavy, you need to move in some different planes. Like the, mm -hmm. that's not to say there's some magic exercise or we need to be quote unquote functional, whatever the hell that is. But it turns out that one, we learn from error more than repeating the same thing over and over again. So getting something to where you may not be as good at it, or you're having to get in a different position is going to be a learning experience for all intents and purposes. So mm -hmm. if the goal was to become athletic, yes, you know, doing yoga is not going to take your one RM up on your squat more than likely, but it at least is getting you in some positions as an athlete to tolerate different positions. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think if your program is limited, whether that's by choice or by like design, 
you know, so it's, so it's really specific. I could make a stronger case for like, okay. And on maybe your off days, we have some unilateral patterning movements. You're going to go into like a deep lunge. You're going to do hurdler stretch. You're going to do mountain climb so- something right like that. Uh, and maybe same thing for the upper body. You'll do a kneeling one armed press with the kettlebell or like a windmill, whatever Turkish getups. Uh, not not because I think any of those things are like uniquely beneficial, but it's like if you're not otherwise exposing yourself to these things at some point in your training, at some point throughout your training year, it's like, well, that's a deficiency you have. And and it's it's an opportunity to get better. Uh, and just as you said, it's like, yeah, your motor learning is going to improve when you screw stuff up. It's like a pinball. You're, it's like a pinball machine. It's like the ball's coming down, oop, doop, hits the thing, and you're like, ah, that was a bad way to move. I'm not efficient at that. I'm going to learn. Your cerebellum remembers that it's like, okay, if we have to do that via mobility or stretching work on off days, I guess that's a low stakes, low fatigue way to do that. My preference would be that that's baked into your program in some form of fashion throughout the training year. If we're thinking about it at that big of a scale, like your general development training blocks have more unilateral work from lower body and upper body. You have more dynamic stuff uh, than SBD. But I could see a case where somebody's like, I will not do that. And so you're like, all right, well, let's do these other funky days. Well, yeah, I think that's part of it It is really, there's 10,000 different approaches to this. Mm -hmm. And there isn't one set of you know, mobility or stretching or whatever that's going to fix this. It, it's things that you will do to get you moving in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if when people are like, what if I just want to get flex, you know, more flexible? And I'm like, well, what, what does that mean to you? Like, do you, is it just being able to do the splits? Do you want to be able to, I don't know, interlock your fingers and pass them behind your body and what do do this, you know, circus, circus Olay st- stuff. Like, okay, well, we need to define like what we're kind of doing and then we can approach that systematically. But if it's just like you want to become bendier in general, like, I mean, you can do some additional stretching if you want. I just have not found it to be a beneficial use of time for improving any measurable outcome that people come to barbell medicine for. I want to have less pain when I move. I want to be more athletic. I want to be stronger, have more muscle mass, have better cardiorespiratory fitness. I'm like, damn, that's a lot on your plate, bro. That's a lot. I don't know that you need to do the pigeon stretch for 10 minutes this week. I'd probably rather see you do some cycling or, or whatever, you know, or, or meditation, even though I'm not big into that, like whatever, there's other stuff that you can spend your time. Get out with. and shoot some basketball, read a book. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I think part of this is this tendency we have to really want to bucket things into categories. And, you know, to your point, you know, well, I want to get stronger. I want to increase my cardiovascular fitness. I want to become more supple. And you're like, okay, well, we can do a lot of these with a few movements because there's some overlap there. And once we have gotten the highest yield we can out of that, well, what time do we have to devote to maximizing the other variables that you want yep. to focus on? Yep. All right. I like that answer. Next question. Does the general population really need hypertrophy work? Does the, does the gen pop really need to gain more muscle mass? What do you think about that? Well, uh, I, I think this is phrased through traditional bodybuilding, get yoked side of stuff, but, uh, considering that you could make a, a decent case that we have a bit of a sarcopenic epidemic Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh then the answer to that is yes yeah so (laughs) i I think that's where it goes do i think we need to be programming three sets of 12 to 15 at rpe9 for bicep curls for everyone no Mm -hmm. but uh you know if you have no strength training background and we start teaching you how to do some of these movements odds are there's going to be a hypertrophy effect there if caloric things are in order yeah yeah, I, I think that, you know, if, if the question is, do we need to focus directly on hypertrophy work to the exclusion of other things like getting stronger or gaining uh, uh, proficiency in a bunch of movements? I think the answer to that is no, because I think there, that the overlap uh, from gen- a good strength and conditioning program is going to drive a significant amount of hypertrophy. It's just 
part and parcel with with a good program. And I, from that standpoint, I think yes, everybody needs to engage in resistance training. They need to get stronger, and by proxy, they uh, not by proxy, but by doing that, they're going to also gain muscle mass, and that would be a net win across the board. I have not met people. I'm like, oh, you're too strong. You get you're carrying too much muscle, and damn it, your cardiovascular fitness is too high. Like, what do I do? You're just too fit. Um, I, further, I think that the avoidance of like get gaining muscle mass and, and that sort of idea, like, oh, I don't want to get any bigger. That is harmful. Like the idea that, oh, I don't want to get any bigger. I don't want to get any muscle mass. So I can't lift this hard thing, or I can't do these engage in strength training because it just, I'm going to get bigger and that's bad. That's been bad. That's been net bad, uh, particularly for for uh, the you know female lifting community uh, and and maybe the female community at, at large, you know. And they're like, oh, I got to do this pink dumbbell stuff. I got to do the booty band workout. I got to do this, that, and the other. And it's like, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. Yes, I know millions of dollars have been made in this industry. And so, if you're a free market person, you're like, well, people want it. People are getting it. It's like, yeah, well, if I had my druthers, I would say, hey, ignore all that bullshit. Do a, uh, an intelligent strength conditioning program where you're moving uh, fairly challenging weights in uh, many different movements throughout the week that train all the major muscle groups. Uh, do that a few times a week. You'll be set and you'll gain muscle mass and, and you won't notice like, wow, I'm gaining, I've gained so much muscle mass. I'm just too big now. I've been trying to get too big my entire life. My entire life has been built around how, how do I get bigger? How do I gain more muscle mass? And I'm just approaching non-small person status. Like we're just starting to get there. Yes, I understand that there are some women out there, uh, for example, who gain a lot of muscle mass rapidly. And when they tell people this, you know, particularly trainers, they're like, oh, it's impossible. You don't have testosterone or whatever. No, there's some people, you're a hyper responder. You're a Tia Claire Toomey. You touch a weight and you get jacked. Great. I also want that to happen to you so we can identify who you are. That way we can go do great things. Like if you are the hyper responder, please identify yourself. Call me up. We'll go do great things in sport if you want to, of course. I'm not going to force it, but that's, yeah, that is a potential outcome. I just think that's rather unusual for men or women. Uh, and so I would just feel comfortable promoting strength training to everyone uh, to the exclusion of this pink dumbbell booty band bullshit that is, you know, taking over social media. That's a bit of a rant, but. Yeah, I agree with everything you said, so carry on. Yeah, if you have a booty band, burn it. <laughs> we don't, we, maybe see if you can recycle it first, but like, don't, we just don't need it. All right, uh, we're getting to the injury rehab section. Okay, Dr. Derek Miles, in your opinion, is pelvic floor therapy legit? Uh, yes, is the simple answer to it, but it's just like every branch of rehab and that there are good people and bad people. As far as addressing things like uh, stress urinary incontinence, uh, painful intercourse, they have good evidence for their efficacy. And mm -hmm. now, once again, it's finding a good provider out of it. But uh, there just recently was a position paper come out talking about screening for erectile dysfunction amongst PTs more uh, as it has some corollaries with identifying cardiovascular risk later on. And really, I think. It's not like I'm leading with that question in my sports <laughs> clinic. Not, not the first thing you come up with? Yeah. Yeah. And But I, I think there is some of that that if you end up under the care of one of these individuals, you, you're probably going to find some questions in some realms that you hadn't really contemplated before. And especially the, the one that comes to mind immediately is after some types like a prostatectomy, like you probably should go to pelvic health because they're going to train you how to do things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it, it, there are populations where this is a very high yield branch of rehab. Now, like everything, it gets overly extrapolated, but yes, by all means, pelvic floor therapy is legit. Yep. We had a podcast, episode 146, uh, Pelvic Floor Health with Dr. Merrill uh, Alapatu. She's from Florida. She was, went, went to school with you, I believe. Yep. She was a classmate of mine. Yeah. Uh, we'll link that in the description below. Then you can hear me riff on pelvic floor. I think it's, mm -hmm. I also think it's, it's good as long as, again, there's this umbrella that we call pelvic floor therapy. And it's like, is everything good under there? And it's like, all right, well, let's make sure we know we're talking about the same thing. 
Okay. Any tips for dealing with golfer's elbow? This uh, individual is riding on their mountain bike and it's killing them. Uh, I've uh, had golfer's elbow on and off since I started playing golf. When I know, big surprise. Uh, I have not actually had to do anything about it though. Like I just, you just kind of like, well, it feels a little uncomfortable, but I don't really have to do anything to modify this experience because it just, it waxes and wanes. And when it goes away, I'm like, oh, great, it's gone. Comes back, you're like, mm, well, playing a little much, a little too much golf from what I'm ready, what I, from what I'm actually like ready for. So, so there, there's not a ton of high level evidence for this, but it tends to fall in the tendinopathy camp of approaching it with some isolated wrist work or elbow work, as it were. And this is where things like, you know, wrist extensions, wrist curls tend to come in beneficial, uh, especially for like medial elbow pain. I can't tell you how many people I've sent off to get the captains a crush and just work on that as a protocol. And it tends to work pretty well. You know, it's interesting. I thought I was making this up. Uh, I do, I have a wrist roller that I've been using as for some conditioning efforts for motocross. And I noticed that when I was doing that, I would get less significant elbow symptoms. Like not only, I just wouldn't really have any elbow pain. And I was like, ah, I'm probably just making that up. Like whatever, just, I'm not, maybe I'm not playing as much golf or maybe my swing has changed or, you know, some other sort of, uh, external factor, but yeah, that makes more sense. I guess I'll keep using my wrist roller then. Carry on. Carry on. Uh, okay. Can heavy back extensions be good for avoiding active spinal flexion during the deadlift? Well, before I'm, I'm going to let Derek take the lead on this, but I will just say this. You cannot deadlift without spinal flexion. There's no way to, to get around that. Now, whether or not you go through the neutral zone and into like full on flexion, that's an area of debate, but you cannot not flex your spine during any lower extremity movement, whether that's a kettlebell swing, a good morning, a deadlift, a squat or whatever, you're, it's going to be some spinal flexion there. So in any case, Derek, can doing heavy back extensions help people avoid spinal flexion during the deadlift? What's funny is I was going to lead with the, you can't avoid active spinal flexion. Oh, but, nice. All right. But, good. Yeah, yeah. I'm on the same page. Yeah. But with heavy isolation work, you might increase some local capacity, but it still comes down to a motor pattern. And it, there's not a lot of great evidence that doing a ton of isolation work translates into real motor capacity out of it. Like the, that comes from doing different variations and practicing different iterations. Now, the, the one counter to this that comes to mind is we do beat the drum of quadriceps strength in order to uh, get back capacity and motor control after an ACL reconstruction. But there it, it still is increase the strength and then beat the living hell out of it with different motor pattern drills in order to address it. So it, it's a chicken or egg side of it. Yeah. I do think that like uh, for people who have a tough time like, consciously like putting their back, like back into extension or holding a quote unquote neutral spine, like just adopting that position and like bracing around that you might get some better motor control out of doing an isolation exercise. You just feel it and you're like, Oh, that's that thing that I need to do or want to do or want to try to do. But I think the carryover, the transference between that and an actual deadlift is relatively low just due to other constraints of the system. So even if you're doing like back extensions off a of GHD or off a, a back extension bench, it is, you don't have the same hip angle, the same knee angle, the hamstring length, et cetera, uh, as you do in a deadlift, which is why the transference is relatively low. In fact, and, and, and that's just not my like opinion on the matter, but in fact, when you actually look at the strength between power lifters and, um, uh, uh insufficiently active folks and their like ability to maintain back extension on a back extension bench and like how much motor activity is going on there. It's the exact same. It's like this person's untrained. This person does a bunch of deadlifts and they have the same exact sort of, uh, isometric, uh, uh, motor excitation during a back extension an isometric hold. And it's like, you wouldn't expect that because this person deadlifts, So their back's got to be stronger. It's like, yeah, it's stronger in the deadlift but not necessarily in this other exercise to just transference seems to be not that great. Um, I, again, I do back extensions, I program them, but for me, it's more like, uh, okay, we're just going to have some additional work to that's less stressful than doing more deadlifts, doing more 
good mornings uh, or whatever. If I was really trying to build the deadlift up, I would do more deadlift variations. Um, and if I needed to pick a lower fatigue uh, or lower load sort of variation, it would be like a high handles trap bar deadlift, or it could be a partial range of motion thing like an RDL, for example, uh, or maybe something with a little more vertical torso angle, like a sumo deadlift, um, things of that nature. But, you know, you can get wild with it if you want higher, higher velocity stuff, kettlebell swings, uh, and, and things of that nature. Uh, I've, I've, I've done like, we call I call it a death march, which is probably not a good term to use, but it's like when people are wa- doing like they're walking and they're bending over and grabbing like kettlebells, standing up, take another step, bend over. It's effectively like a single leg, good morning kind of thing or single leg RDL. Uh, and they're just marching that way. But I don't suspect that that has the most transference over to a deadlift and certainly not like motor control during a deadlift. It's just like general training, if you will. I don't know if that makes sense to you. No, it makes, uh, I think sometimes getting so far away from the thing you're trying to get better at is also beneficial just because it, you've almost hit the reset button on the entire pattern. Yep. Okay. Uh, is there any evidence that smaller muscles get injured more often? And I, I'm just going to say this before, again, I'm going to let you take the lead. I don't know like how we're localizing, oh, this is the muscle that's injured outside of like, you have a, a observable muscle tear or like some sort of like imaging confirmed, like, damn, that whole thing, you just evulse that tendon. Like, so when, if it's like, oh, I have a deltoid pain versus Terry's pain or like, I, I don't know, how are you figuring that out? You know? Uh, well, one of the best educational moments of my life was sitting in spine conference one day and one of the physicians being like, well, so we call it a lumbar strain. Yes. Like when have you ever seen a radiologist call a strain out of any of the lumbar muscles in the MRI? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. You're you're absolutely right there. But to me, I would probably go the other way because if you say muscle injury to me, the things that are coming out are quadriceps, hamstring, calf, biceps. Yeah. Tear, tears though. Right. Yeah. 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 Or something I would consider a strain. But I mean, if we're going by the strictest definition of strain, then wherever you get DOMS is where you're at. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think the bigger, like the larger the muscle, if it's flatter, if it can move at a high velocity, like those things like portend probably a higher risk because you're more likely to move the thing at high velocity mm-hmm. <laughs> under an eccentric load and you're likely to have a more, uh, a greater risk of, of muscle injury. Um, but as far as like, do you get pain in areas where there are smaller muscles more frequently than larger muscles? Again, I don't, I don't really think so because this larger muscle just takes up a bunch of space. And so like <laughs> your pretest probability of like where the pain is going to be at the bigger, the bigger location, just it's like a numbers game, like surface area is bigger. So it's like you're more likely to have shoulder pain somewhere over the deltoid than like your subclavius specifically, you know, I don't know. Just my two cents. <laughs> I don't know. What's the, what's the weirdest, like smallest, most obscure muscle that you've seen in a physical therapy note? If, if you've seen something that's remarkable to you. Well, the one that comes to mind off the top of my head is a subscap tear. Oh, how did they... I've seen, I've seen a few of those. And it normally is like a, a big trauma where somebody reached out to grab something as they were falling and ended up tearing it off that way. But I've seen, uh, I'm, Probably at five or six of those for certain arm, repairs. Is their armpit like super bruised or whatever? Or like, oh, it's it's a slow rehab because you think about it. Like a lot of the stuff we talk about limiting external rotation, but here, like you don't want a ton of internal rotation. Oh, so how you, do you just live? like, yeah, you just sit them there. And, and some physicians will put them in a gunslinger brace where it, it actually like puts your hand like you would think the old Western people like pointing their fingers straight ahead. Yeah. So yeah. it's, I mean, I wouldn't want to live six weeks like that. So, but that's the most obscure one I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah. What about like, uh, what is it? Uh, cervical rib syndrome or whatever, you know, or you got like to get an anterior scalene release or something or like, <laughs> yeah, the, the, we're getting into a different animal now. Yeah. So. Yeah. I've seen, I've seen a few, uh, in motocross in particular, uh, fractured scapulae, like mm-hmm. like, a, like a just an explosion fract like somebody gets landed on or like lands flat on their back and the scapula goes into like you know a number of pieces and i'm like 
Ooh, what do you do with that? And they're like, it'll grow back together. <laughs> well, but that's one of those things. Like if you, it almost gets back to that conversation of like, what is bad? Because we had motocross uh, a decent bit when I was in Florida and the injuries you would see out of that were just on another level. It turns out if, you know, high velocity and getting altitude, eventually gravity is going to win the battle. That's true. Yep. That is true. Can't confirm. Uh, gravity remains undefeated. Okay. Uh, Dr. Derek Miles here, episode 195, October 2022, question and answer session. What are your recommendations for IT band syndrome? All right. So what is IT band syndrome? Is this a thing? And then what do people do with it? So iliotibial band syndrome is basically, you can think of the t big tendon that runs down the outside part of your leg. It comes off your tensor fascia lata. And this is where you'll hear a lot of people talk about like rolling and doing things like that. But it also is one of the places that we know you really can't change tissue structure with any uh, physiologically normal applied forces. Yeah. Uh, as far as in the short term. Now, once again, you get a motocross, I'm sure you can do something to it. Uh, but <laughs> Cut it. really, yeah. Ooh, where you tend to see this is more in the running population. And the evidence here isn't super high level. There are some papers that really attest to strengthening your quadriceps, some that are more in the strengthening your lateral hip. But really, uh, the underlying thing comes down to strengthening your lower extremities. And then the good old load management conversation to where if you are someone running 20 miles a week and getting symptoms four miles into a run, we might be limited to 15 miles a week and three miles a run as we're going through the rehab side of it and then building back to prior levels and beyond. Yeah, it seems like the strengthening, like the lower extremity in general is a good play. And then also like in a way that is not the same way that you're experiencing pain, right? Because do it, you could, for example, improve somebody's strength if we're measuring this by like seated dynamometer reading at a quadriceps extension. If you had them do like sprints up a hill, for example, mm -hmm. you're like, all right, well, we can improve strength that way. But because it's still running in this case, it's probably not the most therapeutic, like improvement in strength. So we'd want to do some just regular resistance training stuff. And whether it's, you know, oh, it's quadriceps focused or hamstrings focused or, you know, lateral hip or glute or whatever, it's like do it all again. Why, why not? Why not both? I just do the whole thing. Um, yeah, the so funny, like with the with the foam roller bullshit, it's like, all right, you're laying on this thing. And somehow the force vector from this thing is directed only at the trigger point or the knotted tissue or the whatever. And it's applying all enough force to break that down, but yet not cause any bruises or not any structural damage around this one particular area, despite you using like, you know, this blunt object to roll yourself out. That makes no sense. Like just no sense from the jump, but people still do it. They're like, it feels good. I'm like, hmm, yeah. I guess, you know, rolling around on something can feel good. That makes sense. I mean, yeah, it feels good. Knock yourself out, but it, it's not the thing you need to be doing right now. I mean, this gets back to the uh, what people want versus what they need conversations. Sure, yeah. So, yeah, you were just thinking about whether or not you could. You never thought about whether or not you should. Jurassic Park. We're going to get that into every podcast, I think, from here on out. It's going to happen. Okay. Uh, last two questions. This is the potpourri section. This is the section that Austin hates, but we'll see how Dr. Derek Miles feel, uh, fields these two uh, tough ones. All right, first off, who is the greatest athlete Bo Jackson. of all time? Bo Jackson. All right. I, that is a viable answer. Now, why, are you going to support this? Or are you just going to say Bo Jackson and just hope that everybody knows that he's like a multi-sport well, he, athlete? He was, what, the one person to score a touchdown and hit a home run within 24 hours of each other? Yeah. In the same day. Yeah. I, yeah. If you just the video of him running up the wall to catch the home run where he literally spider man up a wall is probably one of the most impressive athletic feats I've seen. And if not yeah. for his injury, I think he likely would have broken records across multiple domains of sports. But, you know, does that disqualify him from the discussion? Mm. I, I would say no. Yeah, I think if you're saying like greatest athlete, like just based on athletic ability, and if you're measuring athletic ability and, to, and like stick and ball sports, particularly stuff that we 
value here in the United States. Bo Jackson would be an excellent pick if you're going just by like win or win percentage or domination of a particular sport. It's hard to beat Tiger Woods, just what he did at the scale he did. And then in addition to like, yeah, not only do you have like the longest consecutive cut streak made and no one's even close, right? And you have all these majors in a a very competitive era and you change the game forever. But oh, by the way, you came back from like horrific, not only life stuff, but also like injuries to win a major championship. Yeah, I don't know. Lydia Ko would be up there too for golf, obviously. And and Annika Sorumstam actually has a higher win percentage than Tiger if you're just restricting this conversation to golf. But when I think about the GOAT, I mean, I think I think Tiger. There are other sports. Obviously, there's probably some badminton player out there who's like literally is undefeated their entire life. But I think when the stakes are lower, it's tough to like include them in a conversation. Wait, I don't know. Our listenership's going to be like, you don't know. You forgot about. But this I think this person. is the fun part of this conversation because we used to play this game all the time. But for strict longevity, I would give it to Yager. Yager, dude's fifty and still playing professional hockey. Ooh, I remember because he was on the Penguins, and then like that's when it, like the Blues are hated. We had Chris Pronger. We have you know Mike Shanahan was a coach for a little bit, and then uh, Doug. I forget his name. Anyway, I was into it at the time. And every year we'd get our asses kicked by the Red Wings. And then Yarmir Yager on the Penguins. I played with him on NHL 97, like each time like, between him and. Uh, so I he was 25 in 97. Yeah, he was a stud. Yeah, yeah. And still played in the. Yeah, so he's, he's still playing in the Czech Republic now. 10, no, he just. We, yeah, he still, yeah he's still. So he's he still was playing. in the NHL, I believe, until uh, wow. three years ago. And still, like, Damn. taking pretty regular shifts. That's wild. Uh, people are going to be like, who's the greatest lifter of all time? I don't know, man. <laughs> I just saw this guy bench four or five in high school. Once. I mean, it might... yeah, yeah. It might be David Ricks just because of his longevity. Like, he's still a stud. But, you know, some people, uh, yeah. I, I don't know. Olympic weightlifting wise, I mean, I don't know. Maybe Piros just for what he's what he's done for the for the sport. But again, now I'm including other stuff other than just like world records and and you know medals and and stuff like that. So it'd actually be hard to beat Laksha's Lasha's record, you know, him or Rizazade's uh, record. But people don't like to lump in the super heavyweights as like the greatest of all time. Because, but look, if you're if you're snatching two twenty five kilos, I feel like you might be the goat. Just I right think off you're the, the bear, anyway. not the goat at that point. Yeah, 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 at that point. Yeah, yeah. Okay, last question. Episode 195 here, Dr. Derek Miles. What is the most worrisome fitness trend right now? What's sad is I saw this question earlier and it, it, I think I just didn't want to contemplate answering it. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, we're not going to uh, get here. I don't know where I would go with this. I, I think there, it's just this constant thought that there is one way of doing things. And and there's not a brand Mm -hmm. for it. It is the brand of saying, this is the way, this is the only way that is the most problematic side of it. And, you know, I I live more in the rehab side of performance. So it is the, my system works and my system is the only system. So I guess my answer would be now that I've mentally worked through this certifications. (laughs) Ooh. Yeah. Just more certifications. It's, It's like, People, okay. it's funny that people only want an SBD, but they want every letter of the alphabet after their name. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I get it. Like I, I get ha- wanting to have letters after your name. I, I understand that, <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I think, I think that's probably similar to my, my take on it. It's like, it's almost like a gatekeeping thing, but not knowledge wise, more like there's this pushback against fundamental activities that we all agree are beneficial. We all agree that resistance training is beneficial. It'd be very, I have not heard anybody say resistance training. Eh, nope. I've heard people argue like the degree to which it's more beneficial than other modalities, but everyone in general agrees that resistance training is beneficial, but people are gatekeeping like people's uh, participation in these based on risks that do not exist or risks that we do not have good evidence are even plausible. 
And so and you have people reducing this down to like biomechanics or particular anatom- uh, anatomy uh, findings or whatever. And so it sounds scientific. It sounds legit. And all it does is scare people into like, I am fragile. I am uh, potentially going to be broken. And if you don't believe that this is happening all the time, like you, you go, you're, you're not on social media. Like this is what, this is how people who have, a little bit of education are earning livings out there. They're effectively gatekeeping people for participating in resistance training without professional guidance. They're saying, oh, don't do this. You're going to hurt your shoulder. Don't do this. You're going to hurt your back. Don't do this. You're going to have knee pain. Or have you ever had knee pain? It's probably from this. And you're like, oh, shoot, there's a there's an anatomy picture within this guy's Instagram or TikTok. And it's like, and it's highlighted. Oh, it looks professional. And it's just like, uh, the, we're, it's just the blind leading the blind, right? And so that is the most worrisome fitness trend because it is so financially rewarding for these people. That's why you're seeing the number of these types of folks grow. If it was not earning people money, if they weren't able to like generate a substantial amount of revenue that where they could leave clinical practice or stop being a personal trainer in a gym or whatever, they wouldn't be doing this, but they are but they are. And so that is the most worrisome fitness trend to me because now you can't just, you know, swat these people away like flies because they're like, oh, they've got hundreds of thousands of followers or, oh, they do have this professional degree or, oh, they have all this content. And you're like, now I have to like give this person a platform and argue with this imbecile. Like, and, and I don't, and I need to say this. I don't think that people are doing this on purpose. They're not doing it with nefarious intent. Like I'm going to go get the public. I'm going to, I'm going to hurt people, but they never, again, never stop to think like, is this doing more good than bad? And, and further, like, what if I'm wrong? Like, what, what, you know, what, what if I'm wrong? Like if I, if I'm, if I'm wrong about this RPE stuff, for example, right. Like in pushing that and like, uh, 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 sort of self-efficacy and like, uh, if I'm wrong about all of that, the worst, the worst thing that happens is people got maybe like a little bit slower results than they otherwise would have. But I'm not like physically limiting folks from participating in activity or like living their life otherwise. This stuff is actively like hamstringing well, folks. To that point, I wish like we did have a holiday where you signed into Instagram or TikTok and it randomly assigned you to another person in your same demographic, just so you could see what their feed looks yeah. like versus yours. <laughs> And I'm sure you're the same way as me in that you get sent things all the time to where people just want to spike your blood pressure. And then there was one earlier today of a side-by-side squat. And it was like, which one of these is right? Which one of them is wrong? And the comments were like a dumpster fire. And the person who sent it to me, I was like, I just can't imagine being the person that is learning how to squat and seeing this and looking at the comments and being like, you know what? I'm excited to go to the gym today. Oh yeah, I'm pumped. Yeah. Let's go squat now. <laughs> like, what, dude? Like, you're not helping people. You're not helping people. You may be hurt. The only person you're helping yeah. is your bottom line. And I look, man, free country, get your business on, make your money. I, but there's so many opportunities to do that without putting out bad information. All right, rant off. Rant off. Hey, look, this is Derek. Yeah, it's been thanks great. Thanks for having me. I, I've enjoyed it. We'll see how many downloads we get. Oh, man. You know, this may, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. But uh, we'll put some of the stuff up on YouTube so people can check it out. These little clips thing, they seem to work pretty well. Um, this has been episode 195 of the Barbell Medicine Podcast, where we bring modern medicine to strength and conditioning and strength and conditioning to modern medicine. Again, I'm your host, Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum, joined by Dr. Derek Miles. I've linked his contact info in the description below, as well as to all the things we talked about, our live and person seminars, uh, other videos, other podcasts, other resources. So check those out at your leisure. But before you go anywhere, please leave us a five-star rating and a review. It really helps drive traffic to our podcast so we can keep bringing you all the latest nuance in health and fitness. We'll see you next week and every week right here on the Barbell Medicine Podcast. Mm-hmm.